Section 16 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27-28, to 28, 1893. Minutes of the Conference. F. H. Newell and Eliza R. Skidmore, Secretaries. The sessions were opened in the Hall of Washington, Art Institute Building, Chicago, at 10 o'clock a.m., July the 27th, 1893. There were present about 400 individuals, including delegates and invited guests. The Honorable Gardner G. Hubbard, President of the National Geographic Society, was called to the chair as presiding officer of the conference, and Mr. F. H. Newell, was appointed recording secretary. Several communications from societies and individuals were laid before the conference. The Royal Geographical Society, through its secretary, Mr. J. Scott Kelty, expressed its sincere regret that it could not be represented by a member of its council, in addition to the regular delegate, Sir C. S. Gzowski. The Royal Scottish Geographical Society, through its secretary, Colonel Fred Bailey, offered its congratulations to the conference and expressed its cordial good wishes for the success of so important an assemblage dato sri amar draja of the johor commission regretted that his unexpected departure for europe prevented him from reading a paper on johor on the part of the johor commission he expressed the hope to be able shortly to present the first complete map of johor ever published baron de marajou delegate of the Instituto Histórico, Geográfico y Etnográfico de Rio de Janeiro, expressed the very lively interest of himself and the society he represented in the conference, and presented nine volumes of geographic researches, etc., published by his society. While he could not then speak on the geography of Brazil, he promised a memoir thereon for future publication. Senor Graciano A. de Azambuja, commissioner from brazil congratulated the conference on its meeting and promised for publication a paper on the development of southern brazil m e levasseur member de l'institut delegate from the societe de geographie of paris wrote from new york that impaired health prevented his attendance greatly to his regret his thirty years of geographic study and research inspired him with an intense desire to participate actively in the discussions of the conference he had hoped to set forth the importance of economic geography and enclose the bibliography of his works general john eaton formerly united states commissioner of education took the chair and presented to the conference the hon gardner g hubbard who made the opening address treating of the relations of the currents of air and water to the temperature of countries and to animal and vegetal life hon john abercrombie delegate from the royal scottish geographic society spoke briefly as follows mr president ladies and gentlemen though here to represent the royal scottish geographic society i had not intended to address the conference as i am not a professional geographer and indeed have only been actively associated with the work of the society for less than a year i come rather to pick up information than to impart it rather in the capacity of an absorbent sponge than as an overcharged rain cloud such being the case i confine myself to giving a brief summary of the origin and work of my own society the royal scottish geographical society was formed some nine or ten years ago with the laudable object of educating the scottish public in the subject of geography and of keeping them thoroughly informed of the progress made in the subject in all parts of the world through the medium of a monthly magazine which i am glad to say has also a certain circulation in the united states some of the earlier numbers contain valuable papers on the various methods employed by map makers to overcome the inherent difficulty of transferring geographic points on an irregular globular surface like the earth to a flat surface like that of a map other technical matters have also been treated of at various times so that the magazine has a real educational value apart from the papers descriptive of travel adventure and the strange habits and customs of savage peoples 
our late secretary mr a silver white contributed more than one monograph on the geography and history of that part of eastern africa in which great britain and germany are more nearly interested and they will always possess a permanent value in order to popularize the subject as much as possible papers are read monthly before the members of the society and their friends for nine months every year most of the explorers who have read papers before the royal geographical society of london are willing to speak before us in edinburgh as well as at our branch societies at glasgow and aberdeen the first speaker to address our new-born society was mr stanley after his return from one of his earlier travels of exploration in the great african continent and the session this year was expected to close by an address from lieutenant peary on his projected expedition in the direction of the north pole unfortunately a letter arrived from him shortly before i left home expressing regret that owing to unforeseen circumstances he was obliged to abandon his scheme of coming to lecture in great britain before the departure of his expedition i ought not to omit to mention that though we are a private society and receive no aid from the government our library and the privilege of consulting maps books and consular reports is freely opened to the public considerable use is made of these facilities by persons engaged in commerce and almost daily our librarian is consulted by those who are not members of the society but are desirous of obtaining commercial information in regard to foreign countries in this way the society distinctly benefits the public another way in which the public may receive instruction free of cost is by courses of lectures on physical geography or geology in relation to geography on the distribution of plants and animals over the globe and other kindred subjects these lectures are given either by a member of the society or by some other competent person and are generally well attended especially by the young and by the fair sex the most important work on which a committee of my society is now engaged is a thorough and complete revision of the spelling of the gaelic and worse names in northern scotland in conjunction with the director of the ordnance survey of the united kingdom on existing maps the gaelic names are not always given correctly the spelling is irregular and when given correctly cannot be pronounced properly by a person ignorant of gaelic and its remarkable spelling for instance in the island of skye the cullin hills are spelt on the ordnance map cachulin as if they were called after the old irish hero of that name though they have never received that designation from the people of skye the committee is proceeding in this manner every local name on the map is submitted to three or four of the oldest men in the parish and their pronunciation is taken down by a person speaking gaelic in this way the local pronunciation is surely fixed and if the words have a significant meaning they can easily be written in standard literary gaelic if that should differ from the local pronunciation as i am not on the committee myself i am not certain whether the words are to be given phonetically on the map or according to literary usage in gaelic but i have no doubt that they ought to be rendered phonetically so that even those unversed in gaelic would be able to read them correctly old irish was written as it was pronounced but unfortunately the faddists of the sixteenth century for there were faddists even in those days invented an absurd rule opposed to every philological principle and still in force which they called in irish or gaelic cowlery cowl leathanry leathan that is to say if there is a slender vowel an e or an i in the first syllable then the first vowel of the next syllable must be slender similarly if the vowel of the first syllable is broad as a o u the first vowel of the second syllable must also be broad these extraneous inorganic vowels do not affect the pronunciation and in a reformed spelling ought certainly to be omitted another fruitful source of inaccuracy in writing gaelic words arises from spelling in accordance with a fanciful and in reality a baseless etymology the dictionary of the highland society and o'brien's irish dictionary are full of examples of this sort though there is this excuse for them that both were compiled before philology became an exact science and before old irish of the ninth and tenth centuries was known to the learned world 
the task which the committee has to accomplish is therefore by no means an easy one another subject which the royal scottish geographical society has had under consideration though no action has yet been taken is one that relates to lake basins on all our ordnance maps the configuration of the earth's surface always ceases with the surface of the water no soundings are given no underwater contours and all knowledge of the bottom of the lakes is left to the imagination such a state of things is clearly inexcusable but unfortunately the funds of the society are insufficient for the task the admiralty which considers fresh water lakes beyond its province and draws the line at salt water has been applied to but without success and so for the present the subject is in abeyance general a w greeley chairman of the committee on awards of prizes of the national geographic society made an announcement of the progress of the committee and of the steps taken to call public attention to the generous offer of the society the chairman then introduced madame regina Mani, delegate from la sociedad de geografia de lisboa who made a few remarks concerning the attitude of that society and of the portuguese people toward the conference general john eaton ex commissioner of education of the united states presented the following address on the relations which may or should exist between the national geographic society and geographic instruction mr president ladies and gentlemen voluntary activity in america for the benefit of mankind has an almost boundless opportunity the national geographic society as one of our voluntary agencies has proposed to itself as one of its object the promotion of the knowledge of geography among the people of the united states geography in its narrower sense as a description of the surface of the earth which we inhabit lays under contribution various sciences and includes topics of deep interest its literature is not a collection of meaningless words geographic discovery with its thrilling adventures is by no means at an end but geography in its larger sense not only includes as is said the forms and measures of the earth its astronomical relations the relative positions and distances of places and the representations of the whole or portions of its surface on globes or maps which is known as mathematical geography it describes as well the principal features of the earth's surface as consisting of land and water its atmosphere its climate and its various animal and vegetable and mineral productions which is called physical geography it also considers the earth as the abode of mankind and treats all that relates to the moral or social condition of the different races or nations which dwell upon it so comprehensive is geography in its bold definition as mankind in all conditions must have a definite habitat on the face of the earth so knowledge in all its forms has a local habitation shakespeare has taught us that when the poet would make real forms of things unknown he gives to airy nothings a local habitation and a name herein is recognized a law with which both the action of mind and the logic of the subject of thought are in accord this fact is of supreme importance to the educator he who has the facts in human progress fixed in the place where they occurred has a ready index to the history of mankind to what man has thought and done he may at will call up any actor event science or philosophy he has only to introduce the element of time to unfold in order and at will the record man has made for himself as he has ordered his ways under the hand of his creator naturally as the oak springs from the acorn the human mind follows the tree from the seed to the fruitage and in obedience to this law we have in teaching the historical method naturally too the mind looks on this and on that and compares one with another and in obedience to this law we have in teaching the comparative method geography can furnish from its stores untold data adapted to use in both of these methods most essential to successful instruction out of its data may be drawn in the greatest abundance that which is fitted to the attention and understanding and to awaken the interest of beginners in school and of those of any grade of progress if this view is correct it cannot be doubted that schools among us have treated geography and related subjects most unfitly as a result there has been inattention where there should have been attention dullness where there should have been enthusiasm 
waste where there should have been gain. Let geography be put in its proper place and treated according to sound pedagogical principles, and all that pupils acquire of what man is and what man has thought and done will be gained, with less waste of time, energy, and purpose, and with far more satisfactory results in other subjects of instruction. Geography, if rightly taught, will furnish the pupil what is needed for nourishment of mind, on the one hand, and for discipline, on the other. It will not unbalance the faculties, it will not cultivate reason to the injury of memory, or reflection to the destruction of expression, or vice versa. Here, therefore, in this department of education, there is most ample scope for the efforts of the National Geographic Society. Voluntary in its methods of action, it may move with all the freedom consistent with good reason. It has before it as its objects, one, the perfection of geography itself, two, the dissemination of the data of geography, three, the selection of the data and their adaptation to other subjects of instruction and to the best results in teaching, four, the training of all teachers in the right knowledge of the subjects and in the best methods of teaching them for pupils in all grades, and five, the devising and use of all objects, graphics or stereoptics, and other aids in illustration to make most effective the presentation of places, persons, events, and their relations. Thus, travel will unite instruction with diversion. For the student, man, races, nations will arise and take their places on the stage of action in their true relation and character. The National Geographic Society, voluntary in its character, as we have noticed, in promoting its great ends by improving the methods of education, may ally itself with all cooperative official agencies. Its purposes are most strictly in accord with the statutes regulating that great disseminating agency, the United States Bureau of Education, now so ably and efficiently administered by its commissioner, the Honorable W. T. Harris. By the aid of the facilities of that bureau, and the great confidence reposed in it, the society may bring its helpful service by its leadership, prizes, lectures, and publications to the aid of every teacher and school in the land. Other nations, too, may gain its cooperation, and thus it may accomplish the great and beneficent purpose of its honored president and his collaborators. Following General Eaton's address, the chairman announced, We have with us today a friend who promised to speak provided his name was not placed on the program. He will now address you, Major J. W. Powell, Director of the United States Geological Survey. Major Powell addressed the conference as follows. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the occasion on which we meet, the anniversary of the discovery of America by Columbus, notes a great geographic event, the greatest event of human history. It had a wonderful influence on the world, this discovery of America of which you have heard so much during the past year, and it had an influence in a direction which perhaps you have not considered. Prior to the discovery of America, all the humbugs of the world gathered under the skirts of religion. If any man had an ostrium which he wished to vend, or a doctrine which he wished to inculcate, he claimed that it was a revelation from heaven. Somehow or other the discovery of America changed all that. Up to that time the people of the world had not believed the earth to be round. Here and there a scholar believed it, but the teaching of scientific men and scholars had but little effect on the world at large. When Columbus proved by sailing across the sea that the earth is actually round, that it is in fact a globe, so that the great multitude of people themselves came at last to believe it, it made science respectable and when the feet of Columbus had the effect of making science respectable, people came ultimately to place on the shoulders of science the responsibility of all the humbugs of the world. If a man now has a wonderful nostrum which he wishes to vent, he does not say it was revealed to him by heaven, but it was taught to him by science. If a man wants to bombard the heavens for rain, it is scientific to do it. If a man wants to recover the lost rivers of the arid regions, he has some scientific theory in which to do that work. So science has come at last to be the bolster and the foundation of very many of the humbugs of the world. That is not all. Science has gone forward to accomplish something, and since the time of Columbus, science has accomplished much in the great field of geography. The earth has three envelopes, movable, ever-changeable, 
moving vertically and moving horizontally. There is one envelope of air, another of water, and another of rock. These three envelopes are changing their positions, moving back and forth over the surface of the earth horizontally, and rising and falling forever. Three great classes of movements are discovered on the surface of the earth, one in the air, one in the water, and one in the rocks themselves. We study the movements of the atmosphere in modern scientific geography, and have learned much about them. Your president has today learnedly placed before you some most interesting results of scientific investigations in relation to the movements of the atmosphere and the movement of the waters of the earth. As the winds blow about the earth, and the air rolls in vertical movements, storms gather, and hurricanes blow here and there, and thus we find that the whole aerial envelope is forever in motion. In a similar manner, the watery envelope is forever in motion. It is not alone moving in currents in the ocean and in great rivers, but it is forever moving vertically. In some portions of the earth, twenty inches of water are evaporated every year, and in other portions, one hundred and twenty inches, and the envelope of water, bearing from twenty to one hundred and twenty inches in thickness, is lifted into the heavens and descends again as rain every year. There is a third envelope of the earth, which is in the same manner in motion. Modern geography is no longer engaged simply in the study of the position of geographical localities, no longer engaged solely in measuring the depths of the seas and the heights of the mountains, no longer engaged in simply delineating the currents of the seas and the winds which blow about the earth, but modern geographic science has come to study the origin of the land areas and the reason why the rivers run where they do and why the waters circulate as they do and it is especially throwing vast light in modern times, in the last decade or two, on the origin of landforms. It is classifying valleys, it is classifying plateaus, it is classifying mountains and hills, and explaining their origin. It is classifying islands. This study of physiography, this new branch of the study of geography, is being cultivated in many lands, and it has discovered that there is an envelope of rock moving horizontally with the waters as the rivers wash the hills and valleys and mountains, and moving vertically by upheaval from beneath and by the pouring out of volcanic lavas from below, so that the three movable envelopes of the earth, the air, the water, and the geologic formations of the rocky envelope are forever in motion, and the laws of this motion are being studied. It is thus that the new theme is being introduced into the study of our schools, and the reason that geography is in this conference allied with education is that these new facts, new laws, new principles of this systematic knowledge in relation to the earth are to be introduced into our schools, and it forms a theme of wonderful interest. Colonel Francis W. Parker, principal of the Cook County Normal School, read a paper entitled The Relation of Geography to History. It is printed on later pages. Captain Magnus Andersen, of the ship Viking, delivered an address on Norway and the Vikings. This address also will be found on later pages. At 1 p.m. the session was adjourned for two hours. Afternoon Session, July the 27th, 1893. At 3 p.m. the conference was resumed, about 200 persons being present. The first paper, Geographic Instruction in the Public Schools, was by Professor W. B. Powell, Superintendent of Public Schools, Washington, D.C. Professor T. C. Chamberlain, representing the University of Chicago, read an essay on the relations of geology to physiography in our educational system. Professor William Libe, Jr., delegate from the American Geographical Society of New York, spoke briefly on the relations of the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current off the New England coast describing his researches into the effect of these currents on the distribution of food fishes. Mr. F. H. Newell, United States Geological Survey, read a paper entitled The Arid Regions of the United States. These communications appear among the memoirs and addresses appended hereto. The session was then adjourned until 8 p.m. Evening Session, July the 27th, 1893. At 8 p.m., President Hubbard introduced General A. W. Greeley, United States Army, who delivered an address on interpolar expeditions, 
making a special reference to his own expedition, the explorations of Lieutenant Lockwood, and the terrible sufferings and partial destruction of the party on their retreat. There were about five hundred persons present. At 9.30 p.m., the conference adjourned to meet next morning at the monastery of La Rabida, in the fairgrounds, Jackson Park, and afterward to continue the session at 11 a.m. in Recital Hall. Friday, July the 28th, 1893. The members of the conference met in Jackson Park, where, through the courtesy of Mr. William E. Curtis, chief of the Latin American Department, they had the exclusive use of the monastery of La Rapida, from 9 to 11 a.m. Mr. Curtis and Captain John G. Burke, United States Army, escorted the members through the monastery and explained the precious collection of historical papers there exhibited. At 11 a.m., President Hubbard called the session to order in Recital Hall, introducing Miss E. R. Skidmore, who read a paper entitled Recent Explorations in Alaska, printed elsewhere. Mr. Adolf Ernst, Venezuelan commissioner to the World's Columbian Exposition, delivered an address on Venezuela, and Ensign Roger Wells, Jr., United States Navy, described a trip up the Orinoco River. Dr. Emil Hustler, Paraguayan commissioner to the exposition, was present, but asked to be excused from attempting an address in English. The Brazilian commissioners to the World's Columbian Exposition, Senor Graciano A. de Azambuja and Baron de Marajou, while expressing their highest regards, also made their apologies for not participating more fully. At 1 p.m., the meeting adjourned until 3 p.m. Afternoon session, July the 28th, 1893. Present about 100 persons. President Hubbard first introduced Captain John G. Burke, United States Army, who read a paper on the history of the old monastery of La Rabida, describing the changes in that part of Spain in which it is located. Paul B. Du Chalieu then spoke of his travels among the Norsemen and of the character of their ancestors, the Vikings. Captain Victor Maria Concas, commandant of the Spanish caravels, related what is known of the history of the caravels of Columbus and upheld the Spanish sovereigns in their court. Mr. Frederick A. Ober read a paper entitled In the Wake of Columbus, reciting his searches for relics of Columbus and his examination of the places at which Columbus probably landed. Honorable William E. Curtis, in a paper entitled Recent Discoveries in the Archives of the Vatican regarding early Norse voyages to America, described his successful search for records regarding the probable early Norse voyages to America, and stated that there was evidence there showing a knowledge of land in the direction of North America. Several of these papers are appended. The representative of the Raja of Johor was not able to be present, owing to an unexpected call to London. At 5 p.m. the conference adjourned sine die. End of section 16